Yeah, we'll start in just a moment. Lange som du stiger frem, furet vær bit over landet med de tusen hjem. Ønsker, ønsker det å tenke på vår far og mor, og den saga natt som senker drømmer på vår jord. Og den saga natt som senker, senker drømmer på vår jord. Thank you! Thank you very much! Does anyone want to guess what that was? National Anthem, exactly. Yeah, obviously. Uh, do we have any Norwegians here, perhaps? Ah, all right. Well, I won't tell anyone that you didn't stand up during the national anthem. That's, that's quite all right. And there are many more verses where that came from, but that's the, the first one. So uh, we sing this song a lot on uh, uh, the Norwegian National Day, which is a Constitution Day. Hello, welcome. Find a seat. Thank you. Uh, anyone know when the national uh, day is? May 17th. Oh, 17th. Yes, 17th of May, Sötna Mai. And then uh, all the streets are filled with uh, kids in marching band. I was in a marching band, so sadly my parents had to get up at 5 a.m. every 17th of May, come rain or shine. And everyone's out playing these songs and, and everything else. And it's a big celebration of, uh, well, the Constitution, but more of sort of it's a freedom celebration. Because the history of Norway has been a long history of being part of uh, of other countries, parts of, uh, of Denmark and of, uh, of Sweden. And uh, 17th of May as a celebration really began after, uh, uh, after the war as well. So then it's a celebration of you know, freedom after, after the war. So that's one of the main lines through Norwegian history. So Norwegians are very, very proud of being their own little thing. You know, the small country uh, up in the north. So I'm going to tell the story today of how Norway came to be an independent country, so in 1905. Um, so uh, we, have, uh, we have a goal, a teleology, shall we say. Norway needs to become one thing. And um, you probably didn't know, but Norway is the center of the universe, actually. Yes, right? So, so we understand history with, with the, as in Norway in the, in the center. And the way we, uh, you know, learn history in school, then of course Norway is in the center. And um, I'm going to talk to you a bit about how we learn his Norwegian history in Norwegian school. Which is ironic, because I didn't pay attention at all in uh, Norwegian uh, school history class. I found it very boring. It's this small country up in the north, only five million people. Not that much going on when you have so many other interesting things to study. So I studied uh, sort of world history university, right? That seems to be as big as you can get. I specialized in Chinese history. I lived in China for a while. Uh, I worked at the Norwegian uh, consulate in Shanghai, actually. And it was there one time we had a, uh, to celebrate 17th of May in Shanghai, we, uh, we'd invited the entire, what we call the uh, Norwegian colonies, basically all the Norwegians in Shanghai. Uh, <laughs> and uh, there in their national dress and singing that, that song, Ja vi elsker, right, which means yes, yes I love this country, Ja vi elsker dette landet. Uh, but there was one guy who was the most enthusiastic of them all. And his name was Oli, which is an American pronunciation of a very Norwegian name, Ole. And he was from Minnesota, and he didn't speak a word of Norwegian. But he was wearing a national dress, and he was just so into this, because he obviously had some, you know, ancestors from Norway. And he was so fascinated with every small bit about Norwegian history. And he was asking me all these very detailed questions, and I couldn't answer any of them. Um, so I, uh, it sort of made a bit of an impression that, you know, there, there, is, there is a lot to learn, and some people find it fascinating. Here I was trying to to flee from it half the world across. So it's like an old story that you, you need to sort of leave something behind, right, to appreciate uh, what you had. So it's a privilege to be able to share with you guys today my new take, now that I can uh, pay attention to all the things that I sort of slept through uh, mm -hmm. at school, and tell you about how Norway came to be kind of the way it is today. All right, you ready? Yes. Yeah. We have a lot to get through. Okay, so our destination is Norway like this, the modern Norwegian map that, uh, that we know, that you know very well, having sailed you know, up and down this, uh, this coast now. For most of history, 
Um, there, well, there weren't any Norwegians because uh, there weren't any people up here. It was basically just covered in ice, right? Throughout the ice <coughs> ages, we found up to 3,000 meters of thick ice co covering this uh, landmass. So it wasn't until about 10,000 years, well, 10, 10 12,000 years ago, when the ice caps started receding, um, that you had maybe uh, game animals that were moving further and further north. So hunter-gatherer tribes, you know, from further south would follow along and they might start, you know, settling down by the, the coast down south, up into the Oslo Fjord, and then we found remnants of communities further up north, also to the Lofoten Islands, quite, quite far up north. And uh, these were the first Norwegians, and they would probably continue further and further north as the ice was receding. So Norway, this place, you can imagine as, uh, uh, well, the way north. So it's that area that you had, on your right hand side as you were basically sailing further and further north. That's a country of Norway. So it always has this very intimate connection to the ocean and the coastline. That's where everyone lived along the coast. But the early Norwegians, they, pro they, well, they didn't, probably didn't call themselves Norwegians and they wouldn't have referred to themselves as uh, one people necessarily. So we have like the many early kingdoms of Norway. And most of them, as you can see here on this color code, that they would have centered around a fjord system. So many different fjord systems. Um, hello, 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 welcome. You missed Thank out you. on all the best parts. <laughs> yeah, it's only just downhill from here. No. So uh, fjord systems, uh, because a fjord, that's a liquid highway of the time. You know, you have primitive uh, communication technology. So what you would do if you were a jarl, jarl, that's like the old uh, Norse name for a king, you would, uh, you would be, well, the, the most wealthy landowner, and you'd probably have your, your seat at the end of a fjord, and you would say, whatever this fjord touches is part of my realm, because that, then it would be easy to trade back and forth, you know, you could sail in and out. But then, in the neighboring fjord, to get there, you had to sail out and around or go up over a big mountain. You'd probably never met them before, spoke a very different dialect at the time. And if you got there, there would be a different jarl who would say that this fjord is my fjord, and now you are in let's call it the Rugalam kingdom. So you have many of, these, uh, many of these small kingdoms. And we don't know that much about them. We have archeological records, but we don't have sort of proper history from the early, uh, early times. History being, well, records, record, written records, basically, right? So what people said about themselves in the time they were living in. Uh, what we do have is oral traditions, right, handed down. Uh, so uh, you've heard a few of the, you know, folk tales from uh, from up here, and you might have some familiarity with uh, with the mythology of the region, Norse mythology. Uh, now, quite a lot of people they know of the Norse gods, right? This picture here, that's a modern AI representation, pretty much exactly what we think the gods looked like uh, at the time here. Odin, Frigg, and Thor. Thor, of course, has been immortalized by this very, very handsome blonde Australian gentleman uh, in the Marvel uh, universe. So these are very much alive today. Um, and uh, in the old Nor Norwegian stories, they're quite dark often, and they sort of explain how the landscape came to be. So we're sailing up and down, we see all these mountains, but usually they all fit into a narrative. So if you heard the narrative about the Seven Sisters mountain chain, right? They were seven troll sisters turned to stone because they were chased by the horseman, which is another mountain further up by where you cross the Arctic Circle, etc. So you can sort of navigate yourself in the country by reference to all these stories that have been passed down. So those are like some of the early histories, you can say. Um, and of course, the trolls and things from, from Northern mythology live very much on today and modern fantasy. You might recognize them from Lord of the Rings. Tolkien, you know, he was a big fan of Norse mythology, studied, you know, a lot of the Norse texts. Um, and uh, maybe Gandalf, you know, modeled on Odin, the wise uh, all-father. But then when we get into the realm of written texts, then we're talking about runes, Nordic runes. You might have seen them before. And they popped up quite late to the writing game, as far as writing and civilization is concerned. So, uh, so the runic alphabet is from about 150 AD, and they're a mixture of, uh, of phonemes and ideograms. So what does that mean? A phoneme, a bit like our alphabet today. So it's symbols that represent a sound. So if you look at this one here, this uh, snaky uh, symbol, uh, you'll probably guess what sound it makes. 
It seems to be like the universal S symbol. And, but it also represents an idea. So this symbol here could just mean success, which happens to have a lot of S in it as well. Um, so, um, and we find these on rune sticks, right? They were carved into sticks. And usually they were used for uh, bookkeeping. So it's not like riveting reads that we find from the early uh, Norse people. But now we know <laughs> who owed how many heads of sheep to whom kind of business. We learn about the economics of the time. And also some of the earliest runic inscriptions that we found, you know, on, on houses and in, uh, on, on rocks, etc. Uh, usually they're quite similar to, well, they're, they're like the old Norse equivalent to what you'd find written on the wall of a public bathroom stall today. So some sort of rude thing about the neighbor's uh, wife or something like that. So even if we don't learn too much about, you know, what society was like, we know people haven't changed that much in, in 2,000 years. Um, but I think you are probably uh, more proficient with runes than you think. No one grew up studying runes, perhaps. Uh, not even the Norwegians on the back bench. But uh, there are two runes that I think you know. I didn't understand that. <laughs> Your phone doesn't even understand runes. My goodness, but how apropos, because, because your phone, madam, which should, should be on the soundproof, I've no idea what's up to. I thought I was speaking clearly up here. And, but your phone probably has Bluetooth on it. And look at that. Ah, indeed, right? So the Bluetooth logo is the Nordic H and the Nordic B put together. And why is that? That's because there was an old Viking king called Old HB, Harald Blåtan. And Blåtan means Bluetooth in Norwegian. And he was famous for connecting people together. Oh. Just like Bluetooth. You know, this is a design team who earned their, uh, you know, earned their keep with this one. And also now for you guys, if you don't get anything else out of this talk, you know, <laughs> this is your money's worth right here. This is the, the trivia of the day. But we leave the runes behind, because when we get to proper history, uh, then we need to jump uh, about a thousand years into the future to uh, around year 1200. And to learn about Norway, we need to go all the way to Iceland. Because in Iceland, around the year 1200, you had a bunch of churchmen who, uh, you know, spent their days writing, maybe copying the Bible, etc. Um, and uh, they wrote the Norse sagas. You might have heard of saga histories. Um, and uh, quite often when we talk about sagas, we pretty much just talk about one author, and that is this gentleman, Snorre Sturlason. So he was Icelandic, and uh, the Icelandic people, they were the descendants of Norwegians. Norwegians who've come sailing over from around the year uh, 600. First, maybe someone who was blown off course, they discovered Iceland. And then later on, uh, Iceland was a place you would send, if you were one of these uh, rivaling Norwegian kings and someone got into trouble with you, you would banish them to Iceland. So Iceland's a bit like the Scandinavian version of Australia, perhaps. <laughs> Just send them, send them out there. Um, so these guys in Iceland, they were trying to write the histories of their forefathers. And that's what the sagas is, the histories of, uh, of Norway. And the most famous, uh, yeah, I say fact or myth, because, uh, you know, it's hard for them to, uh, hard for them to know. Uh, so we've sort of matched different stories uh, with each other and we look to the archeological record, but otherwise it's hard to know if he actually knew what was happening 400 years ago in Norway. Um, but most histories are based on these stories. So these are like the primary sources that we have about the early Norwegians. And here we have Heimskringla. And Heimskringla, that's a chronological account of Norwegian kings. And the Heimskringla, Written by Snorri Sturluson, tells the story of Harald Hårdfager, Håkon den gode Harald Gråfler, Håkon Jarl, Olav Trygvast, Olav den Helige, Magnus den gode Harald Harald, Olav Kyrre, Magnus Berfet, Magnus Brynne, Harald Lille, Håkon Herdebrei, og Magnus Erlindsson. Wow. Yeah. It's a lot of kings. It's also a lot of something else. Do you see a pattern here? It's a lot of Harald. It's a lot of Olavs, a lot of Magnus, and uh, what's the last one? And a lot of Håkons. Yeah, and just to remind you, my name is Magnus, 
a kingly name or my parents were just lazy because my uh, well half of my football team growing up were called Magnus so you could just say go Magnus uh, my dad's name is Harold or Harold Eric his father's name is uh, was Harold Frederick and then we have Harold Christian and then we have Harold so there are you know uh, those are the names you have to go with our king now is called uh, Harald his father was called Olav his father was called Håkon our king to be is called Håkon Magnus two for one Boom, there you go. <laughs> so, uh, you know, they're not very imaginative, these, uh, these kings. And um, we learned about the history of Norway by learning the stories of these kings. We would read the sagas as well, right, when we were, when we were kids. Uh, so I'm going to speak to you uh, about three of these kings, beginning with the most important one, who is at the top of the tree here, Harald Hårfagre. And any other king that came afterwards needed to prove that you could trace your lineage somehow to Harald Hårfagre. So, look at this beautiful guy. Harald, he grew up west coast of Norway, a place called Harugusun. And the way the story goes, it's the mid 800s, Living in Norway, you had loads of rivaling small kingdoms, right? A lot of, a lot of fighting, and of course, there's a girl involved. So he, he fell in love with a beautiful uh, lady, you know, a local uh, noblewoman. Um, but, uh, but she didn't want anything to do with him. He was, uh, he was good for nothing. So she said, Harald, I won't date you until you have united the entire kingdom. <laughs> you know, so you need, uh, you, know, you, you need to be able to show that you have something, uh, you know, something to bring to the table. So Harald, he uh, well, really uh, wanted this woman, so he said, okay, and he declared to the entire kingdom that I, until I have united all of Norway, I shall not shave a single hair on my body. Yes. And as you can see, this didn't happen in a weekend. <laughs> right? This was quite the campaign going on, so he got this wonderful long hair. <laughs> Uh, shall we call it fair? So his name is Harold Fairhair, right? Hårfagre means fair hair. And uh, after a while, he managed to, uh, to unite the kingdom or to beat all of his other rivals in 872 at the <coughs> Battle of Hafersfjord. And then, whether he then had a shave or not, I'm not, I'm not quite sure. <laughs> but we know about the Battle of Hafersfjord from, uh, from a sung poem, Harald Kvad. Kvad is like a sung poem. And I thought I'd play you a little bit uh, someone reading this and what we think it would have sounded like in the original old, uh, old Norse. Check this out. <laughs> All right, well, I'm, I'm, I'm glad you can hear the similarity. Yeah. It's just, it's just hurdy-gurdy to you. Uh, well, I can't understand any of that. So this, uh, to my ear, it sounds a bit Icelandic, which sort of makes sense, because this is from the time when a lot of people were going over to, uh, to Iceland. Actually, many of the early Icelandic people, they were rivals of Harald Hårdfagre, who were, you know, banished away or who fled. Um, and I've been to Iceland once, and then um, I was about 10 years old, my brother and I, we were running around a little shop uh, and there was an older lady who was working there and she was giving us very sort of disapproving looks. Then we went up to, uh, to pay for our uh, things and she said to us in perfect English, she said, you have ruined our language. <laughs> she said, did not like the sound of modern Norwegian being spoken in her shop, I can tell you. Uh, so probably a little bit like, uh, like Icelandic here. So Harald, he then united the kingdom, but it didn't look anything like the modern map that we're moving towards. Uh, it was still... What yes? What does it mean? What it means? I have you no idea. <laughs> <laughs> Hear thee in Hafersfjord, when the, the men of... I don't know, I, ha I have seen a translation, but I wouldn't be able to make sense of this. Uh, yeah, you would, you would need to be a scholar. But it's telling the story of the battle, uh, of a big battle, basically. So I guess lots of guys were fighting and Huddle won, is the, uh, the easy version. It's part of the longer text. Um, so, uh, but the kingdom that he united was just, you know, a, a, a smattering of coastal regions, you know, western Norway, a little bit further up north, down south. So nothing near what we have today, but it's moving in that direction, right? Because we're, we're trying to tell the story of how Norway came to be what it is, so we know where we want to go. Um, the next king is called Harald Har Råd. 
might be a familiar name to some. So he uh, was, you know, a, a minor noble in, uh, in Norway, and then he set off on a bit of a gap year, you can say. So he traveled all over Europe, made his way to the Byzantine Empire. Mm -hmm. And there he started working uh, in, for the emperor, made his way into the imperial guard, became a very uh, wealthy man, traveled back to Norway, and then led some armies expanding out, and he um, met his end uh, in the year 1066, the Battle of Stamford Bridge in York, where he died, yeah. And you might be thinking, what on earth? died that year. Exactly, because you know of another battle, right? 1066, all the Brits in the room, you guys are drilled in, Battle of Hastings, and stuff like that. This is the Battle of Stamford Bridge. So what on earth is Hoddell doing dying on bridges in York? This Norwegian guy. Well, uh, the year 1066, he is very much a, uh, a guy of his time, a proper Viking king. So we are now right that date, actually, 1066, marks the end of the Viking Age, the way historians uh, deal with it. Um, so uh, we have to speak a little bit about the, the Viking Age. Uh, so um, the people who lived in Norway during that time wouldn't necessarily have referred to themselves as Vikings. Uh, Vikings, it's more like a verb. It's something you do. You go Vikinging or something. <laughs> Right? And it means something like getting a bunch of mates together, and you uh, buy a boat, and then you set off to see what you can find. It's like a stag night. It's like a stag night, right, yeah. exactly. And you set, off, you set off west, and the Norwegian western frontier is just ocean, and then you have a lot of potential. So people have been doing that for a long time. Most people probably never came back because they, they died. You know, this is, this is a dangerous business. Some people settle down elsewhere. Uh, but then we know that at a certain point, suddenly loads of people started going viking -ing -ing. And the first, when we say the beginning of the Viking Age, we date to 793 AD. And that is due to the sacking of the monastery at Lindisfarne in uh, northern England. We still haven't got over it. Still haven't got over it. Yeah, very sorry. Uh, what can I say? Sorry? And uh, yeah, just say it. <laughs> uh, they weren't a fan of monasteries, I can tell you that. But these guys. Um, so, and that was like the beginning of a great, of a great expansion of, uh, of Vikings going all over the, the, the continent. And why so many? There are probably there are many reasons. People aren't uh, by sort of a one mind on this. One is that when, when you had a certain amount who'd managed to do it once to get to the continent, come back, tell everyone about it, then everyone knew it was possible and people started setting out. So it's like when you set a new record in the, like the 100 meter sprint or something, next year everyone's doing it. So it sort of spread as a bit of a, a, bit of a thing everyone was doing. Uh, maybe a demographic pressure that you had a lot of uh, maybe second sons, you know, young men with uh, no great prospects back where they were. So suddenly going Vikinging sounded like a much better deal. And we all know if you have young men with nothing to do, that's a recipe for uh, for disaster. Um, and also then new boat building technology with these uh, with these long ships that could then cross uh, open seas. At this time, most people didn't dare to leave the coastline, but they could cross over to. Uh, uh, to the United Kingdom and down to, down to Europe. Uh, so many things that, that played in. But this led to a great expansion, uh, most of the action happening in the British Isles here and uh, on the coast of continental Europe. They also spread through uh, Russia and the river systems here. Um, also went all the way around. We know they got to the Holy Land and as we mentioned, you know, the Byzantine Empire here. So spread all over the place. Many just settled down. Uh, you know, blended into local population. Other people brought people uh, back again as, um, as slaves. Slaves who could then, uh, we also hear tell of uh, people speaking many different languages joining as part of Viking crews as well. So this was something that could sort of change who was part of these uh, crews. Uh, but the, the story, the history of the Vikings, I mean, it's written by people who were visited by the Vikings. And visited is the nicest word I can use in this case, right? So, so it's about these, these uh, barbarian devils coming down from, uh, from the north and spreading fear and terror everywhere they went because they could usually, they could get to a village very fast because you had these uh, low berthed ships that could sail in very shallow waters and then they could do a sort of hit and run tactic and by the time the local, uh, you know, military came around, the Vikings were, were long gone. These are spread a lot of fear throughout the continent. And this went on for a couple of hundred years. Um, I want to talk about one guy, because King of France was sick and tired 
of all these uh, northern barbarians uh, making trouble on his land. So he stopped a group of Vikings and said, hey, if you protect us against your cousins up in the north, then we shall uh, to make you a duke and you shall be a noble here in France, but you answer to me the king. And there was one Viking who said yes to this deal and his name was Rollo and his tribe. If you've seen the Vikings series, you recognize this guy. A uh, very famous television series that tells this story. Um, and Rollo was then given this area right here, which then got the name Normandy, land of the Normans. If you're from there, you're a Norman, because a Norse person, right? Because you are a Viking. Then after a few generations, they just sort of blended in, started speaking a version of the French that they would speak there at the time. Um, but then they also had their eyes on the British Isles. That seems to be in the northern DNA. So a guy named William, he decided he was going to sail over and conquer everything. At the same time, Harald Harald, he also wanted to sail over and finish conquering all of this. You, you had a lot of different Viking outposts there and then uh, a long history of that. So as they were sailing, um, the story goes that there was a northerly wind. That meant that, that, meant that Harald got there first, whilst William was battling the winds. And then he was fighting the local uh, forces. Harald lost, now as we know, uh, the Battle of Stamford Bridge in 1066. But then the local forces were very much weakened, which meant that when William came over, he was able to conquer the whole thing, thereby gaining himself the name William the Conqueror. The, the southern bit. The southern bit. England. The whole thing that's worth conquering. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I know we got a teacher at the first row here, so but we're we're doing we're doing easy general history, <laughs> right? So, uh, and how long was that? We say French rule, like four hundred years. Like four hundred years, yeah. right? They never really no, left. they never they never really left. They never really left. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. All right. We'll we'll we'll, we'll take this later. Yeah. And then, uh, so, so we like to say, I like to say that if the wind was blowing the other way, there would have been 400 years of Scandinavian rule instead, right? It's a bit of alternative history. But since William was a Norman, we can say he was basically Scandinavian anyway. So we take credit for it, uh, pretty, uh, pretty much. Um, so that was Harald Hardelde and his death, the end of the Viking Age, because then he no longer had this big expansion. Then it sort of started uh, retreating a bit back, uh, back up north. But also because Harald Hardelde, he had a Christian burial. He was a Christian man. No longer were these the Thor-worshipping heathens from the north, because with all this, uh, you know, communication back and forth, bringing back plunder, etc., they also brought back new ideas, and Norway had become Christian um, at this point. So then we need to talk about our last king, which is, uh, he was king right before uh, Harald Harilde, and his name is Olav den Helie. <coughs> Pardon me. Bless me, Olaf the Holy. Thank you. I did that on purpose. Um, Olaf the Holy. So, he was also a bit of a Viking guy, traveled all over Europe. He picked up some uh, administrative uh, ticks, tricks, went back to Norway, unified the country even more, sort of what they say. And then as he was uh, fighting against some of his rivals, he died at the Battle of uh, Stikilsta. And then uh, his followers took his body and they went to bury him in a place called Nidaros. And as the story goes, he was buried, and after about a month, the locals, they'd started noticing that you had all these exotic flowers growing on his grave, and a blind man could suddenly see all these things happening. So they thought, what's going on? They did the only thing that made sense, which was to dig up his body, I guess. Uh, and then they looked at his grave, and uh, there was just a beautiful, fresh scent his hair had kept growing, he had rosy cheeks, they say his nails had kept growing, which is kind of a gruesome image. Um, so basically they said, this is a miracle, and they turned him into a saint on the spot. So the Pope said, this is saint material up here in the north. And this is the first time Norway had gotten their own saint. And then they started building a cathedral upon his grave, which you might have seen earlier today, the Nidaros Cathedral. Nidaros, that's the old Viking name for Trondheim, where we were earlier today. Um, and to this day, we're not sure where his grave is. Most people think it's right beneath like the main uh, altar, but we're not quite sure. Uh, and then, well, it took a long time to build this, but then you started, got your own, we got our own archbishop up here, and then you started the pilgrimage business. It was booming. People started traveling here. 
And at this point now, Norway is no longer this barbarian uh, outpost where Vikings come down from. Now it's part of greater Christendom, right? Of the European uh, Commonwealth of the time, shall we call it that? Uh, connected by, by one religion. So we can <laughs> It's all right. <laughs> it's funny. Yeah, it's funny. Sound effects. Yeah, sound effects. Um, so, which takes us to the next chapter. Now we're out of the, uh, of the heathen times, shall we say. Norway, part of Christendom. And this leads to sort of uh, what's viewed as a bit of a golden age in Norwegian history. A lot of things happen in this time. You have a, a big, uh, well, Norwegian... Uh, uh, civil war going on, you have a lot of important sort of legal documents, many sort of nitty-gritty things, but the important thing is that it's viewed as a period of great prosperity for Norway, and we're a big seafaring nation, now trading a lot with the European continent. With that, you also start having a big presence of the Hanseatic League, the League of Germanic Merchants, uh, who had sort of semi-sovereign outposts all over Europe. Uh, Bergen, the largest and most northerly one, um, or the, or the l l large one in Norway, uh, so, uh, now that we are going to Bergen, you'll see that the, their national beer is called Hansa beer, after the Hanseatic state, uh, Hanseatic League. And um, now with all this trade back and forth, you know, Norway was doing very well, but like drinking a bit too much Hansa beer, you can end up with a bit of a hangover with all of this communication with the rest of the world. Which brings us to the next chapter, which is the Black Death. The Plague. And now all of you, many of you from different European countries, so you have your own stories, experiences of, of the plague, um, I can imagine. Uh, but the reason why this is very important for Norway is because um, this was, Norway was hit the hardest of the northern uh, countries. Probably has to do with the long coastline, all these ships going back and forth. So the way the story goes is that in 1349, a Hansa ship came sailing into Bergen. Uh, and they let down the gangplank, rats started running off, and then people started dying. And within one year, two-thirds of the Norwegian population died. Uh, so we can imagine that, completely uh, sort of wiped out almost. And that's important because then you have the golden age that led to being completely <coughs> weakened by the plague, and that left Norway vulnerable for outside powers, stronger neighbors to take advantage of Norway. That's how the story was, was usually told. So this is viewed as a very important uh, milestone. So then, going on, Norway then um, starts uh, collaborating a bit with the surrounding kingdoms. So Sweden and Denmark uh, get together in what's called the Kalmar Union. We have some Swedes and Danes here, don't we? Anyone? <gasps> yes, well, anyway, the Kalmar Union. Sweden and Denmark and Norway together. With Norway as the weaker part. Um, Sweden leaves. At a certain point in the 15, uh, 1500s for Sweden. It's a national pastime, making fun of the Swedes. Uh, so it's only Denmark and Norway, but it quickly becomes apparent that Denmark is the dominant partner. Um, so uh, after a while, the, the, the sort of union is put all to the side, and it's just absolute monarchy under the Danish crown. That's all it is. So now Norway is just a part of Greater Denmark, which at that point also includes Faroe Isles, Iceland, and, uh, and Greenland as well. And this is from 1660. This is viewed as a tragedy in traditional Norwegian storytelling. Like, you know, the, the, it's, it's, you cannot exaggerate how bad this is. So a historian from the 19th century saying, from the day Norway came under Denmark and lost its own lords and kings, it has also lost the power of its own manhood and is now becoming so old and gray and so heavy that it cannot even bear its own weight. So you can imagine that the people living at the time were probably waking up every day going, Ah, Denmark, <laughs> so terrible. Where are the Norwegian kings, right? Um, but we, uh, a lot of new uh, history writing is focusing more, you know, on what it was like to be maybe a regular peasant in the country during the time under Danish rule. And this is a time where you had probably sort of rising uh, living standards. So everything wasn't necessarily as bad as all that. It's also a time period where a lot of things happen. If you say we're jumping from like the 1400s all the way to, uh, well, basically the next thing we talk about in Norwegian history is the Norwegian constitution in 1814. We like to talk about 1814. So from 1400 to 1814, about 400 years, that's what we call skip over history in Norwegian class. It's not important. 
because it's problematic because it's a Danish history. Yeah. Everything people are doing, they're doing as part of the Danish crown. So it's sort of hard to fit into this image of, you know, of independent uh, Norway. But in this time period, you know, you lots of things happening. Uh, Europeans discover that, uh, holy cow, there's a whole new uh, world going on uh, on the other side of the Atlantic. A big deal for Norway as a shipbuilding nation um, and, uh, you know, merchant uh, navy, which is very big. So that's a big deal. We also have the whole Reformation going on at this time. Um, and then we, we get into the whole, uh, you know, Enlightenment period, big ideas, uh, people studying probably in, uh, mainly in Copenhagen, you know. Uh, and then we have the, uh, the great uh, revolutionary age. We have the French Revolution, American Revolution. And all these ideas are inspiring the, uh, what shall we say, the, the literati, educated people in Norway, many of whom would have considered themselves Danish but then also a growing idea of Norwegian national identity. So we get into the sort of romantic uh, nationalist period. Um, and um, through this period as well, we have uh, uh, well, the, the copper mines of Røros, silver mines of Kongsberg, a lot of big industry growing up, uh, big lumber t timber industry. And uh, as I mentioned, all of, these, all of these big ideas that are simmering and going on. And they are laying there as we get into the Napoleonic Wars. We're getting close to 1814 when Norway gets its constitution that we're so proud of, we, uh, we go around singing our, the songs all the time. So that's the next chapter, the birth of the modern Norwegian nation. And that's got a lot to do with a guy called Napoleon. Who's an expert on uh, the Napoleonic Wars? <laughs> Oh, I hear. Good. <laughs> this exactly, right? That, that, that's a spoiler alert. Exactly right. And that is important for the. We're, we're getting there. We're getting there. So, this is a complicated war we remember from school, right? That there's a lot to learn about. Shifting alliances, they still write books this thick about a single month and one year on this whole conflict. So, we're going to do the easy peasy version. Um, and, and why it's, how it's relevant for Norway. Okay, so what we need to know is there's a war going on. A guy named Napoleon is involved somehow. He is French, and his great rival is across the channel here, uh, Britain. Um, and uh, there, there are loads of shifting alliances going on. So they have, uh, at one point, a big battle, the Battle of Trafalgar, which was a navy battle that happened down off the co coast, of, uh, coast of Spain. And uh, who uh, won that? The Brits won. And this was a great, uh, great victory. Uh, and they were very, very happy with themselves. Uh, meanwhile, uh, probably the, the Danish king sent a message saying, congratulations on your great victory, but we are staying out of the war. So uh, Denmark, Norway were neutral at this point. They were not siding with Napoleon, not siding with Britain, uh, because everything's going fine up here in the north. Thank you very much. Um, but then after that naval battle, the only other navy that could rival the British navy was the Danish fleet. And the Danish fleet guarded the entrance to the Eastern Sea here with the warm water ports of Russia. And Russia was a big continental rival that was also sort of switching sides a little bit. <coughs> so Britain, in a move that you could call the greatest military genius in the world, or the greatest stab in the back in history, depending on whose side you're on, uh, decided to uh, say that we're not going to trust uh, the fact that Denmark say they're uh, staying out of the war. So they went in and they stole the fleet, the Danish fleet. It was called the Great Fleet Robbery, 1807 or 9, or around that time frame, right? Um, and at that point, the Danes, they were very, very annoyed, and they said, that's it, we're going in with Napoleon. Mm -hmm. And therefore, Denmark-Norway was on the side of Napoleon in the war, which, spoiler alert again, was the losing side. <laughs> right? So Norway's going to lose the war somehow, or Denmark is going to lose, uh, lose the war. Meanwhile, our neighbors here, the Swedes, they had a bit of a, a sort of imperial past, you can say. Um, Finland was a part of Sweden at this point, or a Swedish territory. Uh, Sweden and Russia get into a battle. Russia takes Finland from Sweden, says, now that's mine. Sweden is very much annoyed uh, about this. And then as things goes on, Russia and Sweden, they team up together with the Brits and a 
some other countries together and they decide to go together against Napoleon and they beat Napoleon um, 1814 uh, uh, leaving Denmark Norway on the losing side now at this point Sweden very much pleased with themselves they start marching up here and they think what we can just go through Copenhagen and take over we're on a winning streak and then the Danes they say no please don't do it you can have Norway <laughs> And then the Swedes, who just lost this big chunk of land here, they said, that's a pretty good deal. Now we get this piece of land. <laughs> so very nice. Meanwhile, the Norwegians, we've been stuck up here. There's been a naval blockade that the Brits have had throughout the war. And we also had big, there was a big battle against the Brits up in Hammerfest. Uh, so a lot of naval action going on in this period. Uh, but there's been some distance with the mother country, shall we say, in, in Denmark. So local, you know, a lot of forces have had time to, uh, to, to, to muster um, on the Norwegian uh, mainland. And now when we hear we're going to be given over to another, another country, again to Sweden, then there's you know, a little bit of wiggle room. Because the Swedes, they're busy hanging out, drinking champagne, uh, planning the future of the concert of Europe kind of thing. So at that point, a bunch of uh, gentlemen, we call them the Eidsvoll gentlemen, because they met in Eidsvoll, which is an area, uh, well, not too far from Oslo. They met up and they uh, wrote the Norwegian constitution, which is very much based on the uh, American constitution, actually. The Norwegian Grundlov, the ground law, the foundational law. And they declared Norway to be an independent republic. They thought, now's our time. Boom, we're going to go in. At which point, the Swedish king was very much annoyed. The Swedish king at this point, to make things even more complicated, was one of Napoleon's old uh, military guys called uh, uh, Jean-Baptiste Bernadotte. Changed his name to Karl Johan to sound a bit more Swedish. Uh, so there's, you know, a lot of uh, weird things going on, but they said, okay, this means war. And then you have forces, you know, lining up to go to war, a war that Norway probably would have lost, uh, being the weaker partner. But they managed to come to a diplomatic solution um, where basically uh, Sweden says, okay, Norway, you can keep your constitution. You can also keep your parliament, because Norway at this point has an uh, indigenous parliament. You can also keep your courts. So pretty much everything you need to call yourself an independent modern country at the time. But they said you shall be under the Swedish crown, and uh, Sweden shall represent Norway uh, and everything that has to do with foreign policy and military matters. So then the Norwegian leadership said, all right, that's a step in the right direction. We're not going to war, so be it. So then Norway is a part of Sweden as we go into the 19th century and the 19th century the 1800s that's a time when all these big ideas of national identity and national independence they're all very very trendy and Norway has just found itself being passed over to another country and um, the whole story writing of, of how of how it's uh, you know such a travesty that Norway came under other countries is being written at this time and this is the time where all of our great national icons show up so we had a lot of skip over history, but the history you focus on is from 1814 and then to 1905. This is where we spend the majority of time learning about, and that's where we find all of our national icons. So now it's quiz time. <laughs> a who's who of uh, Norwegian national icons? All right. Mm. I'm not going to ask the Norwegians to participate. Um, although you may, you maybe don't even know who everyone is. That's the thing. Uh, we're going to start easy, though, shall we? Who's this? <laughs> Come on. Nobel? Well, ah, Nobel's a Swede. Oh, well, you see, it is. <laughs> yeah, very dangerous territory here. <laughs> um, although it is a very, I mean, this is confusing business, right? Well, so we were part of Sweden at this point, so it is. It's okay. No. All right, who's this? Greek. Edvard Grieg, very good. That's the easiest one, right? A uh, uh, gentleman from Bergen, the composer known for smash hits like bum 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 right? You, you've heard a lot of his songs, I think, if you, even if you don't know they are Greek. Inspired a lot by uh, Norwegian folk music, right? Uh, trying to get back to the proper Norwegian uh, music. He worked a lot with this guy, who is from uh, Shean. His name is... His name is Ibsen. Henrik Ibsen, the playwright, and he's actually, after Shakespeare, the world's most played playwright. Because uh, his plays have been played all over the place. 
He wrote a play called A Doll's House about yeah. a lady named Nora who left her husband. Can you imagine? It caused quite the scandal at the time. Um, so these guys, big from that, from that period, Norwegian icons. Who else do we have here? Uh, Camilla Collett, early in this time. She's sort of considered uh, the first Norwegian feminist by many. What does that mean? It basically means she was a woman writing about what it was like to be a woman at the time, kind of thing. Uh, and, she, and she's a very uh, famous, influential writer. She used to be on the Hundred Crown Bill, which I would show to you, but now they've turned her into a cod instead. <laughs> yeah. Nothing personal against Camilla. They, they removed all of the historical figures and put in uh, animals. Uh, boring, in my opinion. Um, uh, so that, sir, we also have... Uh, yes? Sorry, because you didn't have uh, female suffrage at this time, presumably. People, women were not voting yet. At uh, not at this point. No. But Norway was one of the earlier countries. Mm -hmm. I forget exactly when. 19 something or 1890s. I should know this. I have this written down somewhere. Yeah, early, early 1900s. Yeah, yeah. yes, indeed. Um, Sigrid Unset, she won the Nobel Prize for, uh, for literature for her series Kristin Lavranstotte, talking about, you know, a sort of a Middle Ages uh, time. Uh, peasant uh, girl, very famous uh, series. Fredrik Stange, the prime minister, first Norwegian prime minister at the time, he was uh, presiding over a lot of big infrastructure projects, things like that. Who else do we have here? Oh, we have Henrik Varglo, one of the most famous national poets down in the left corner here. Um, he was, uh, one piece he's famous for, uh, it's called On the Jewish Question. Um, so we all no, you know, the, the plight of Jews in Europe and, and where, where that is going to end up as well. Um, but he was very much arguing for toleration uh, for Jews. In the Norwegian constitution at this time, there was a paragraph that said, no Jews are allowed in the realm. Um, to be fair, it also said no Jesuit priests. Because uh, it was just quite an, uh, you know, it was an intolerant Protestant constitution, uh, basically. Uh, but uh, the largest thank you to Henrik Wagland's work, that, that, that was changed in the 18, uh, 1860s. Um, Björn Stjerne Björnsson, big, he was a big uh, nationalist agitator, you can say, uh, who was a big part of the independence uh, movement, a writer. He wrote the lyrics to the national anthem that I sang coming in. Ja, vi elsker dette landet. Uh, that was Björnstjerne of Björnsson. This guy? Munch. Munch. Munch, yeah. Not Munch, but Munch. <laughs> Munch. Edvard Munch, exactly, the painter with the scream. Scream. <laughs> scream picture. <laughs> Who we missed out? Ah, and the last one. He's funny. Bilbo Baggins. Bilbo Baggins, exactly right. Bilbo Baggins. Do the Norwegians recognize who that is? Ah, yes, yes, yes. You know who he is, though. Um, so you might know uh, Norwegian has two official written languages. Have you heard this? Yeah, yeah we've heard no. that. And we call that Book Norwegian, Bukmol, and New Norwegian. Because at this time, we'd been under Denmark for a long time, so everyone was reading and writing Danish. If you went to school, you learned, you learned Danish. But we were trying now to figure out what is Norwegian, what makes us different from the Danes and the Swedes, so it wouldn't do to have a Danish written language. And we had so many different dialects that didn't really match the written Danish at all. So what Eva, his name is Eva Rosen. What Eva Rosen did is he traveled around the country and he was gathering all these different dialects. And then he sat down uh, over a weekend, perhaps, and he wrote, he, he wrote an epic, a new written language. And he said, this shall be the written language of the Norwegian people. It's much better, and at least it's not Danish, he said. Uh, and it was called New Norwegian, or they called it country language, Landsmål. And the idea was that everyone would use this. But as you can imagine, if someone was to come today and say, I have a much better version of English, trust me, uh, without any of the weird spelling, it's going to be hard to get those things through. So most people didn't quite accept this. Uh, there was a big push to have it. But today, it is an official written language. And some areas, some dialects, they have this as their first written language. It's what they grow up with. But otherwise, in the entire country, uh, the book Norwegian, the, the Danish Norwegian, is still sort of the default now, so most people uh, people use. Um, but you need to, every single school child needs to learn new Norwegian at school, which is why Ivo Rosen is probably the most hated man in all of Norwegian history. <laughs> probably. 
Um, so he's, uh, he's from this uh, time. And two last uh, people we should mention, you've heard a bit about already. You know, the polar explorers. This is the time, it was very trendy to go around the world and put your flag places, right? <laughs> to go, and Norwegians wanted to do some of that. Uh, but we just went to the poles, right? Anywhere you can go with skis. So Fridtjof Nansen, who was the big pioneer here, he actually didn't make it to the North Pole, but he got the closest, and he, uh, well, he was considered a great, great pioneer. Uh, Amundsen, a little bit later in this time, who did make it to the South Pole, but they both stood for sort of what it meant to be Norwegian. Especially Amundsen became a superstar internationally, and people who maybe had never heard of Norway, they'd heard of Nansen, and when he said, I'm for Norway, then people said, ah, suddenly they were paying attention. And this was important when Norway was going to have a bid for its independence. And that's where we go in the last step. And then I'll let you go. So we are at the uh, beginning of the 20th century. Norway's still a part of Sweden. Uh, but you've had all these, you know, all these people building up the idea of a Norwegian national identity. We have our own courts, parliament, constitution, everything you need. But uh, still a part of Sweden. Um, and probably could have gone on like that. I mean, it's... Uh, very good union probably would have had a similar situation as like uh, probably less different yeah maybe like Scotland right or less different than you have like Quebec in greater Canada today right because I mean languages are very similar etc but there was a feeling that we need you know we need independence and it pretty much came down to uh, to a final thing which was the uh, consular affairs what historians call it because Norway was a big seafaring nation had interests all over the world, but was always represented by the Swedish crown abroad. They thought that was an issue, they thought we want to have our own consulates, a Norwegian representation abroad. But the Swedish crown always said, no, that's, that's going too far. And this basically came to a head in 1905 when the Norwegian parliament uh, voted that uh, we shall have our own consulates. If uh, the king says no, that is a breach of sovereign contract, or something like that, we are no longer in union. And it came to another point, a little bit like uh, in 1814, that it might, might come to war because uh, that bill was, uh, was passed. And um, basically, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's a diplomatic case study that is interesting. Uh, so again, a long story, uh, but exactly how it ended up with a peaceful resolution, uh, something people are still uh, discussing to this day. But uh, so it did. The King of Sweden basically said, okay, Norway, you go your way. And that happened in 13th of August, 1905, when, uh, when then Norway became an independent country. Then they had one last issue, and that was, uh, should they become a uh, independent republic, you know, where you vote for a, pre a president, or should, or should we be a monarchy, or a constitutional monarchy? And at the time, most people felt that to be a respected, you know, country among, or nation among nations, you needed to have a king. That's sort of what you, what you did. Uh, but we didn't have an indigenous Norwegian king that could trace their lineage back to Harald uh, Hårfagre. So what did we do? We kicked out the Swedish king and then we imported a Danish prince instead. <laughs> who could come in as the Norwegian king. Um, which is probably a good idea because he was married to a British princess. And at this time Britain was the superpower of the world. And it was important for Norway to have support from uh, Britain. Maybe this was allowed to happen because the British said yes, because they thought it was better to have, you know, <laughs> the coastal neighbor to their east that was very much, you know, on their team and then weaken Sweden a little bit maybe. So you had all these big power politics that probably led to um, Norwegian independence in 1905. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> the lyrics we said coming in, yes, we love this country, you know, it's part of the story that Norwegians a very strange, sort of patriotic lot, one day a year on the 17th of May. The rest of the year, no, 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 not so much. Um, and uh, a lot has happened since then, uh, but that is way too much to get into right now. I've already kept you far too long, and we have one question. Why is it the 17th of May? Because that is Constitution Day, oh, when the Constitution was written. Oh, that's actually good. Okay. That was a Constitution Day. Uh, oh, no, in 1814, yeah. All right, we're going to do it all again. No, no, no. no. <laughs> oh, very good. If anyone has any questions, please just come up afterwards, but I'm going to let you all go. Thank you very much. That was the history of Norway. Thank you.